Are you interested in playing a war game that isn't Warhammer 40,000? You've come to the right place. Wargaming is a complex landscape of gaming possibility, and it can be a little confusing to navigate at first, especially if you venture too far away from firmly established franchises. Now, I do think that Games Workshop, the creator of Warhammer, makes it really easy to get started in the hobby. So, if you're looking for the easiest entry point into wargaming, I honestly honestly recommend Games Workshop and Warhammer. However, Warhammer isn't to everyone's liking. There are other options out there, and that's what this video is about. Here are five steps to becoming a Wargamer. One, choose a system or choose no system. Do you want to assemble your own game from parts? Well, I mean, it's a war game. You're going to be assembling your army from parts, but I mean, do you want to assemble the game system from parts, or do you want to buy into one company's war game system? Now, there's not a wrong answer. It sounds like a leading question. You can choose either, and it's fine, or a little bit of both, but you just need to understand the difference, because it does affect your end result. When you pick up a random war game from War Game Vault, for instance, you're, you're buying rules. It's a, it's a book with rules in it. It's up to you to equate those rules to models you own, or else to buy models to fit neatly into those rules. The problem is, well, well there is no problem. It's fine to do it this way, but the problem is that now you have to learn about the very scattered market of miniatures. There are different scales even within the same scale. For example, you could go out and buy a battle mech model that's 28 millimeters. And then you could go out and buy a miniature who's supposed to represent the pilot inside that mech. But that figure is also 28 millimeters. So now you've got a mech and the person inside of it looking like they're the same exact size. I mean, to scale, the pilot should be like, I don't know, 8 millimeters, and their mech should be 28 millimeters. But but if they're both 28 millimeter models, then the, then that doesn't that's not how it works. So it can be confusing, especially if you're buying online, because then you're unable to compare one model to another. And there's again kind of no right or wrong answer. It's just you have to be personally okay with the sizes of miniatures that you are buying. But to be okay with that, you need to understand that there is a difference between the different kinds of miniatures you you go out and purchase. Now there are advantages to this kind of disparity. Assembling your own motley collection of miniatures means you get a wide variety of styles, quality for better or for worse, and prices. If you enjoy the eclectic or you're happily unfocused, then trying to fit into one system may not make sense for you. But you have to be ready for what you're signing up for. I mean, imagine this. You've got 50 miniatures spread across a six-foot table, and your army is getting slaughtered. But then you notice a rule about a special ability for soldiers with plasma rifles, and you realize this would turn the game around for you. The problem is, none of your miniatures are holding rifles, because you're playing with random models that you got on eBay. So you cross-reference your list of which models are supposed to be what, and and you see that all the soldiers holding swords are actually your plasma rifle soldiers, which of course is different than all the soldiers holding pistols, which are your normal rifle soldiers. Put simply, it can get confusing and overwhelming when your rules talk generically about models or use different terminology than what you're used to, like when a model you bought off the shelf is called a gene-sculpted cyborg, but your rules talk about a specialist with power fist. You can learn that those two are the same things, but it that's an extra step. So what's the other option? Well, when you choose an existing war game system, you buy miniatures and rule books that were designed for one another. That means that the armies and weapons and special abilities listed in the rule book refer to a specific model in the model line, and the rule book can even show you a picture of that model, and then you can look up from your book and look at it on the table. It's right there. Super easy to identify. There are a few systems out there that include most everything you need for wargaming. Warhammer is the most complete line out of all of them. They have everything from models to paints to rules. But others include Mantic Games, Corvus Belly, Malifaux, and Zombicide. I'll put links to all of those down below. Step 2. Get the rules and read them. A war game is 
really just a way to codify how you play with your toy soldiers. Instead of having a model pretend to shoot at something and then you arbitrarily deciding whether it hits or misses, a rulebook tells you when a model is allowed to pretend shoot and what factors determine its success. It's usually dice, but some games will use cards. The rules govern how your miniatures battle. Some of my favorite rulebooks are Rain in Hell, Space Station Zero, Majestic 13, my own Scuffle Whammer. If you're looking for something like Warhammer 40k that's not Warhammer 40k, that is lots and lots of troops from varying factions fighting on a sci-fi battlefield, then check out Firefight by Mantic. Step 3. Buy miniatures. To me, this is the hardest part. The, the thought of finding miniatures that are suitable to play in the same war game setting and on the same war game table, for me, almost sends me into a panic because I hate shopping even for stuff I like. If you find it enjoyable to painstakingly research product lines and shop around for the best deals on items that work well together, then this part might be really, really fun to you. It's not for me, so I'm strongly, almost desperately biased towards whatever is easiest. Here are some ideas for what's easy. Buy the Maison Labs Field Research Team Starter from Mantic at Games Dead Zone and use that in Space Station Zero. Buy a collection of Reaper Bones miniatures and use that in Rain in Hell. You get what I'm doing. I'm saying buy a bunch of miniatures from one place and use that because that ensures that you get a consistent sort of look and feel across all your miniatures and then you can use it in whatever game you like. Some of these places offer games themselves, like Mantic, certainly you could just play Dead Zone or Firefight. Others don't necessarily, or maybe they do, but you don't want to play those games, and so you could use them in something else. Less easily, you could buy miniatures from a company like War Games Atlantic and assemble a collection that suits the rules you've purchased. Now, don't forget to buy bases as well. Usually you need 25mm or 32mm, depending on the size of the miniature, and some of the rules will actually specify what size bases to use. And when you do buy bases, make sure that they match in height as well, because there's different different kinds of bases in from different miniature companies. Step 4. Build and paint. Now that you've purchased an army, you have to cut the army parts out of the plastic, shave off the unsightly plastic mold lines and sprue tabs, glue the models together, give them an undercoat or prime with white or gray primer spray paint, and then paint them with model paint. For that you're going to need modeling tools like clippers and a knife and a file and paintbrushes and paint. Once again, there's the easy way and the hard way to go about all of this. The easy way is to benefit from Games Workshop's methodology. They offer lots of tutorials at citadelcolor.com slash getting dash started to help you get started in this new hobby of arts and craft soldier making. Citadel Contrast Paints and Vallejo Express Color are excellent lines of paint on two different spectrums of cost. I highly recommend both. Alternately, you can just watch painters here on YouTube like Midwinter Minis, Duncan Rhodes Academy, and learn everything you need to know from them. However you decide to learn how to paint tiny sculptures, it'll take months to get through, because miniature war games tend to require lots of miniatures. The good news is that it's a lot of fun. In fact, it's so fun that it could make you forget that you actually got into this because you wanted to play with the toy soldiers, not just build and paint them. Seriously, it's important to keep your eye on the goal, or consciously decide you have a new goal. I mean, it doesn't matter. Here's how I manage it. I paint on my game table, and I paint in sprints. I decide that I'm going to stop playing games for as long as it takes me to build and paint one box of miniatures. I clear off my gaming table, and I work on the models. When they're done, several weeks later, I'm luckily usually itching to get more gaming time in, so I clear the table off, set up a, a game, and play for several weeks, or until I have another box of miniatures that I need to build. Find something that works for you, or don't, and just decide that you're not a war gamer, but that you enjoy painting. That's okay, too. There are, again, no wrong answers here. Step 5. Get terrain and dice and rulers. Most war games expect terrain. Those are like ruins of buildings or walls or other obstacles. Objective markers, you can use glass gaming tokens or coins or whatever. A battle mat, uh, dice rulers. Some of these components are more common than others, but terrain is a real challenge. Now you can buy terrain from a company like BattleKiwi.com or something like that, or 
build it yourself from literal junk. I stick a couple of bottle caps on the top of discarded Marmite jars and then paint them military green using dollar store craft paint. Next to a little 28 millimeter soldier, they look like big oil storage tanks or something. It's amazing what you can do with stuff you'd otherwise throw into a landfill. And again, there are a bunch of cool YouTube channels where people build terrain out of junk all the time. It's not required for playing, but you can buy a battle mat to give your table extra atmosphere. I use Battletech mats because they're paper, they're big, and they have some extra data on them so I can use those for either quick reference, like, oh, three hexes, that's close enough to three inches, that's good enough for objective proximity. Or to add special rules to the game, like if you walk over glowing green sludge on the battle mat, then you have to roll 1d3 for damage. Compared to neoprene battle mats, the Battletech ones are super cheap too. And that's it! Now you can go play the game. All in all, I think the biggest mental barrier is understanding that wargaming can be as structured as a military campaign or it can be as unstructured as guerrilla warfare. No war game I know of offers the same experience as a board game, where you walk into a store, grab a box from the shelf, unpack it, and start playing. But that's kind of the point, or at least it's one component of the point. Wargaming is something you build. If you want something structured and easy, then buy into an existing system and follow the guidance that the system provides. If you don't mind stumbling around a little, probably buying some miniatures that don't look quite as good in real life as they did on the website and so on, then go grab the things you think you need for a game and start building your own little system. Either way, I think you're going to have a lot of fun. Hopefully this video has made it easier for you to know how to get started. Thanks for watching.